Family, happy Juneteenth. Video log six, Juneteenth and an explanation of institutional bias. So we've come to more clarifying questions that lead to chalk outlines. Our question today is, can we show everyday considerations of institutional issues we can reflect on? And do we have any new thoughts on Juneteenth? This video is intended to be brief, but some of my content is kind of dense, so I can't make it as brief as I would like. I only want to get into two institutions, the business and professional world and education. I just wanted to touch on a couple considerations in the workplace and how institutional bias has become the standard. To begin, black men are frequently afflicted by dermafolliculitis, which are shaving bumps. For a lot of us, it's quite severe. Our entire face becomes cratered and it is quite painful and unsightly. However, the aesthetic for what is professional has been a cleanly shaven face in the workplace. This has failed to take into consideration an entire demographic. When a waiver is requested, black folks are often told we have to regularly return to a doctor to get a new note to address a permanent medical condition. The regular doctor's notes are a deterrent to force these afflicted or those afflicted to shave in lieu of losing pay and taking time off of work. Even when we do get a permanent shaving waiver, it is casually alluded to that beards are unprofessional. While this is changing in modern times, consider the effect and implication in modern times as well as over the last three decades. I dealt with this through my entire 14 year law enforcement career. <clears throat> black women have had an even more difficult plight. While black men's hair has been policed, it is nowhere close to the degree of black women. While some demographics have hair that can simply be brushed, combed, or put into a bun, black women's hair generally cannot be in its natural state, brushed, combed, or put into a bun. Black women have been forced to chemically alter their hair or spend hours flat ironing their hair, burning fingers, ears, and scalps in the process because the presentation of a natural afro, braids, or dreadlocks has been viewed as extreme and unprofessional, unattractive, and even unclean. Why is that? Because the aesthetic for women's professional presentation was based on prejudicial standards such as the culture of the Tignon laws. It's amazing how many times someone has asked to touch my hair or even simply walked up and just touched my hair without asking. It's been actually pretty mind boggling. When we look at the policing of women's attire, the body type of black women has been over policed. Black women have commonly been very shapely with overt hip structures and butts, unenhanced, simply blessed by nature and God. It has been interesting to note how black women with a shape have been policed as appearing unprofessional, all because of their body type, while other demographics with limited to no shape can wear the same attire, the same outfit. The attire fits them the same way but the expression is seen as different based on black women's body type. The workplace has penalized black women because of their inherent qualities. These are just a few examples of easy to see institutional bias, something just to reflect on. Now to education. <clears throat> I was recently sent a video of the Hodge twins. They are the weightlifting, light complected, male versions of Candace Owens. Suffice it to say, they leave a bit to be desired intellectually. They stated that they don't, quote, know African history and don't speak African. This speaks to the bias and prejudice which afflicts American education. Two black men don't know any African history, but know European history. This is because our school systems have essentially taught us that African history which at least 42 million of us come from, is unimportant to American history, while European history is all that is important. 
How bad is this bias? Well, a well-intended teacher of my oldest daughter assigned the class a project. They were to research their ancestry to before their arrival in America. Our family is unable to trace our ancestry further than 1801 in North Carolina. This is common for many black folks. Interestingly enough, the teacher didn't want her to get into how our family got the European Kimbro last name, i.e. slavery. That says a lot about the inherent bias. This project served as only a reminder of slavery. It wasn't intentional, but it's no less the result. During this past school year, my same daughter had a teacher tell her classmate that she would beat him like a slave. Again, she told an eighth grader she would beat him like a slave. The school refused to tell us what they were doing about the issue and tried to pressure us into leaving her in that class. It wasn't until I told the counselor and the principal that I don't want something said or done to my child or a grade in the class to be given and I have to wonder if racial animus was a part of it. It took that statement, emails, and a conference to simply get her transferred to a new class. Last thing in closing. <clears throat> I thought about the Confederate flag and monuments. If you're from the South and have not celebrated Juneteenth, then your Confederacy support is not about your heritage. Juneteenth is your heritage also. The part you don't like to talk about because it hurts your Confederacy heritage narrative. One more time. If you're from the South and have not celebrated Juneteenth, then your Confederacy support is not about your heritage. Juneteenth is your heritage too. The part you don't like to talk about because it hurts your Confederacy heritage narrative. Either way, I love you all. Peace and blessings. 06.